Now, FAB is uniquely multidisciplinary, and when it comes to a subject like food and diet, not only does this play no part in most professionals' training, including the health professionals, apart from minimally, but eating is something that all of us have to do every day, and therefore it is relevant to absolutely everyone. I think we know all is not well with the modern Western-type diet, because everywhere it goes, diet-related diseases follow. Obesity and related conditions. Obesity itself is not a disease, and some people who may be overweight or even clinically obese are metabolically healthy. The majority are not. It is a risk factor. But anyway, physical health, we're all aware that obesity, type 2 diabetes, various immune disorders, allergies, cancers, Basically, one third of all cancers, quite frankly, are attributable directly to diet, is the World Health Organization's own data. If more people are aware of this, they wouldn't feel so utterly fatalistic. There is always something you can do, whatever your genetic risk factors, environmental influences. But really, it still seems to go under the radar that the same diet that's bad for our bodies and our children's developing bodies is equally bad for our brains because essentially the brain is part of the body the over specialization we have these days such that most psychiatrists or psychologists will not think really to think much about what other bodily physical symptoms or conditions or even traits uh, that individuals have this to my mind is a mistake it's the whole person the whole child now we come to these diagnostic labels. Now, this is my own specialist area of research. Dyslexia, dyspraxia, or developmental coordination disorder, if you do the American Diagnostic Manual, DSM. ADHD, autistic spectrum disorders. This symbolic representation really sums it up. These all overlap. The overlaps between them are huge, 30 to 50% in both directions. Pure cases of these conditions, I prefer that to diseases, because none of them are diseases in any conventional medical sense. Pure cases are the exception, not the rule. And these diagnoses, unlike a medical diagnosis of, let's say, TB, not a good one, but at least there you know that was an objective test that has detected a physical reason for these symptoms. That's usually what people understand by diagnosis. I'm afraid that across the whole of psychology and psychiatry, almost without exception, the diagnoses are purely descriptions. In a sense, they don't tell you anything you didn't already know. They certainly tell you absolutely nothing about causes. Because the causes of these conditions are complex, multifactorial, and they differ widely between individuals with exactly the same diagnosis. This makes both research and clinical practice rather tricky. The other thing is the dimensionality of this. This accounts for a lot of the controversy. Does this child have ADHD or not? Well, firstly, as I say, that's not a disease. It's a constellation of descriptive symptoms that could occur in an individual for any variety of reasons. It is absolutely worth checking out everything. You really do need a proper workup and case history and to know in the different situations that child is in, what's going on. But this dimensionality, this figure comes from the Department of Education. In our mainstream schools now, primary and secondary, we're not talking the few special schools that are left here. One in five of all British children have special educational needs. These. Moving on very fleetingly, these diagnostic labels, things like depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, but the same things apply. These are descriptions, they are not explanations. They're based purely on the behaviour or the reported behaviour. Again, they're dimensional. The predisposition to all of these conditions absolutely blends into normal individual difference. And then the overlaps again, very high indeed. If we now think about the role of nutrition, as I say, it is at the moment universally ignored. It plays no part in the assessment, the management or anything in our official management of these conditions. A 
of identification of them. But if you think about it, you need the right nutrients to build your brain and body in the first place, and then to build, maintain, fuel and repair every cell, every part of your brain and body. How could this not be at least relevant, worth checking out, worth asking what the clouds are eating? And vitamins, minerals, essential amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein, and also two very special types of fat, the omega-3 and the omega-6 fats. These are known to be essential nutrients, by definition. If you don't have optimal amounts of these in your diet, you can't make them, and your health, physical and mental, will suffer without them. And yet, we just routinely ignore this. It's very hard to find anybody who, if you were to do all the tests and really try to find out their status, who's actually replete in all essential nutrients. Then we've got this huge issue of individual differences. This plagues, to be honest, nutrition research and dietary you know, requirements are at the population level. They have to be. But individuals differ. And the same amount of a given nutrient might be more than enough to meet one individual's needs and most of the population, but you are always going to find some people whose needs for a particular nutrient are unusually high or, in some cases, unusually low. So this is tricky. There is no one-size-fits-all when it comes to nutrition. And as for allergies and intolerances, well, I think we know, and you've heard something about this today, if you've been in need, this is becoming a major issue. And... Allergies and intolerances to foods really are becoming such an issue that can make life difficult in every way, but can also make it difficult to plan that well-balanced diet.